Okay. Well, I think we'll we'll get started, and if other folks um, arrive, they can certainly um, join us as we as we go. Um, my name is Brenda Schaefer Pellinen, and I am a planner with the Arrowhead Area Agency on Aging. Um, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's session, Assisted Living Facilities Basics and Tips. Uh, before we start, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, today's session will be recorded to share on our Arrowhead Area Agency on Aging YouTube channel. I encourage you to subscribe to our channel so that you're able to keep up with the latest additions to our video library. Um, please keep your microphone set to mute. Uh, just a, an additional note, if you experience any issues uh, with your bandwidth or um, quality of your, your audio, um, um, it sometimes does help to disable your camera if that's the case, especially uh, it seems, especially when like myself are out in a rural area. Um, if you'd like, I mentioned, you can enter your name in the chat box um, and what you're hoping to get out of today's session and how you found out about it. If you have any questions during today's session, please feel free to raise your hand virtually and we'll call on you. Or you can put, if you feel more comfortable, you can certainly put your question in the chat box and we'll address those as we get them. Um, if we have time, we'll take some additional questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, another reminder, um, visit our Facebook page for more information about other upcoming sessions, such as Autism Spectrum Disorder and Aging Adults. Uh, that's coming up this Thursday. Uh, Advanced Planning 101, which is in January. Um, we've also got some sessions coming up on renters' rights and spending down to public programs. Uh, today, we are lucky to have with us one of our partners joining us. Uh, Kristen Perendo is the managing attorney at the Duluth Office of Legal Aid Services of Northeastern Minnesota, where she specializes in elder law and has for 20 years. Uh, she graduated from Mitchell Hanlon College of Law in 2001 lives in her childhood hometown of Esco, where she and her family raise cows and chickens for fun. <laughs> so thank you, Kristen, for being with us today, and I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Brenda, and thank you all for coming. Um, my vision for today's topic with Brenda, we figured we would do a basics and tips session about assisted living facilities because from my clients and myself included, it can seem like a maze. That's why I chose this picture of a maze for the top. But my hope is that at the end of this session, it won't feel quite as maze-like and that you'll have a compass to guide you through it um, to the right uh, assisted living should you need one in the future. Um, the audience that I geared this towards is, is the general audience who, um, may not know where to turn, they just found out that they might need one or a family member might need an assisted living. So these are the types of things that I've learned through my work that people should know and maybe some inside information to get you through the process better about finding it. And like Brenda said, please feel free to ask questions as you go. If you're thinking of it, I'm sure other people are as well. And it makes it more more enjoyable for everybody to, to listen, uh, in my opinion, than me droning on. Um, and that, uh, you can do the next slide there, Brenda. Um, before we get into it, though, I wanted to explain a little bit more of who we are. Um, I'm from Legal Aid Service of Northeastern Minnesota. So we're a nonprofit law firm that covers this whole yellow area in northeastern Minnesota, which is 11 counties. And the square mileage of that is 28,000 square miles, which is roughly the size of Ireland, if you're curious. So we've got five offices. We are all virtual right now, and they can't try to get on. Yes. Um, but we have five offices, and we work remotely right now. Um, but we have instituted some legal kiosks that are spread out throughout the land uh, so people can get online and speak with us and go to hearings and things like that. And there's our contact information. Like I said, we're nonprofit. We don't charge anything for our services. We get funded through different grants, such as the Title III Older Americans Act, 
which Brenda's organization is trying to provide us. Um, and for, it's kind of a neat thing for people who are 60 or older, the Title Americans Act, the Title Free Act allows us to represent and advise people who are over our standard income and asset guidelines. So if you are 60 and you have a legal question, a civil legal question, we don't do criminal law, please call us because we there's a good chance that we can give you at least advice. If it's something that we don't generally handle, uh, we'll make sure we get you to the next right spot. Um, like I said, we do civil law um, and that can be a lot of topics, it's basically the whole world. Um, but we do have some priority areas that we definitely want to help in, which is housing, safety, income, um, benefits and such, uh, consumer, family, those sorts of things. But any other topic, please don't hesitate to call. You call us, it's confidential, just like any attorney law firm. So that's who we are. And um, information will be on the back of the presentation too. Next slide, please, Brenda. So when I think of assisted living and what I want people to know is I want them to know what to know before applying for an apartment and assisted living. How do you pay for it? And how do you protect yourself once you're there? Those are the three main things because you can do things that can help yourself in each of those situations. And there are things that you can do to hurt yourself. And I want you to know both of those things. There are some traps. I want to give you some tips to avoid those type of traps. So I will have tips throughout our presentation today. I think I have 10 of them. Um, so we'll start out with before applying for an assisted living facility. And I want to let you know what is the differences between assisted living and nursing homes because they are different. And you need to know that to figure out which is best for your situation. Should you need some assistance? What do you um, will need to get into them? Um, what they can provide to you and um, whether or not that fits in with your long-term care planning that you may have already done. Paying for it, I want to talk about that. What are you paying for when you go to an assisted living? If, you know, it's a, it's a big ticket item and you want to know what it covers. Um, and then if you can't afford it, like most people can't after a while, what are the programs that can pay for it? And I want to point out that planning for payment is hard. Um, it's hard for married couples, especially if they're going to be living one in the community and one in the assisted living facility, you know, one in their own original house. So that can be tricky. I want to point out some things about that. And then finally, I want to talk about you're in an assisted living. How do you protect yourself? So it's a different landscape now with the new law that came out, effective, fully effective August 1st. So I want everybody to take advantage of those rights that come along with it and just point out some other tips along those lines. So that's what I have in mind for today. Um, next slide, please, Brenda. So what is an assisted living facility? This is Tosh, my cat. Okay, Tosh, say bye. There you go. Um, so an assisted living facility, it's not a nursing home. So nursing homes are also called skilled nursing facilities. Nursing homes are where you need a certain level of care. Um, and if you don't meet that level of care need, then you don't, you're not going to stay there because that's the rules. Assisted livings are lo lesser needs. So you may only need help with maybe one assisted living uh, activity. That might be a good fit for an assisted living. Um, nursing homes are regulated by federal law and state law, mostly federal law. Um, assisted livings are now regulated by state law, the one that's on the slide there, the Elder Law, Elder Care and Vulnerable Adult Protection Act. And I put the statutes in there and the rules that go along with those statutes in case you need to ever look them up. You can just Google them and you can get the whole thing. 
on the revisor, state revisors um, website. Um, the bottom line is it's not a standard or an independent or an independent living apartment. You've got extra rights and extra service. And uh, there's a question here. Do we get a copy of the presentation? I, I'm sure that you will. Brenda can make those available if, if I'm okay with saying that, Brenda. So we will we'll be sending that out and we can also, we'll send a link to uh, the recording once we've got the recording uploaded as well. Yeah, because it's nice to have these citations and then one of the other slides later on, we'll also have some links to some helpful resources. So it'll be handy to have. We can go on to the next uh, slide. And I already touched on some of the differences between nursing homes and assisted living. But um, there's some more. You can see that generally nursing homes are a lot more expensive. The average statewide cost of nursing home care is um, based on last year's figures, but it's $8,781 per month, where the average this year for uh, assisted living is $4,283 per month. Usually you start at a lower amount, typically in the $2,000 area. So it can be a lot less than nursing homes. Um, and the way you pay for them is different. Um, nursing homes are paid by medical assistance once you've privately paid until you're eligible. And they only look at assets really for a nursing home eligibility. For Assisted living eligibility, you look at both income and assets, and the program is called elderly waiver. It's for that when you spend down enough. So those are the main differences. Um, of course, the other difference is that nursing homes are typically one room. Assisted living facilities can be you know, sitting room, a kitchen, kitchen bed, those sorts of things. Next slide, please, Brenda. So nowadays, assisted living are different than what we're used to because of the new law. They used to have um, an assisted living license and a housing services license, and it, it got very confusing. With the new law, they created two types, two new licenses, and now there's two types of assisted living. They're based on whether or not you know, there's dementia care. So the basic assisted living license means that the provider gives one or more assisted living services and they have a sleeping accommodation to one or more adults. And the other license is an assisted living license with dementia care, which is the same, but they have a locked unit for dementia care. So along with that it comes with more requirements as far as staffing and training. So when you're out there shopping for an assisted living facility, and if you have a um, diagnosis of dementia, you might want to pay attention to whether or not they've got the dementia care license, um, if your condition progresses. So I'll have that lot unit available. And next slide, please, Brenda. So the new law also put a forth some minimum requirements uh, for assisted living. Before the new law, it was really wide open. There wasn't a lot of standardized requirements, but now there is. And the statute sets some of those forth. So you, there's gotta be meals. There's gotta be some programming. If you're going to be a provider that's building a new assisted living, there's standards to how that's built and how it's constructed so it's safe and provides enough space and that sort of thing. Staffing is a big one. So there has to be a staffing plan. There has to be at least one qualified staff on site at all times. Everybody, all the residents have to have access to nursing services. And if it's a dementia locked unit, you have to have an overnight awake staff present at all times during the night. Those are all 
Um, it's very nice that that's standardized because in the past there was cases where you would just have somebody on call that's offsite, which can be a problem, especially um, for safety reasons. So it's all in the new law. It's much nicer, much safer. Uh, next slide, please, Brenda. So here's my tip number one. Contact senior linkage line. If you have a senior linkage line, they are mandated by the state uh, to give people sort of counseling about assisted living so people know their options. And then after you do that, senior linkage line will give you a verification code, uh, which will be used in the future when you apply for an assisted living. You'll have to do it one time. But that's just one reason to contact the senior linkage line. There's many more and we'll see as we go on. They're a super resource. Next slide, please, Brenda. So tip number two, you have to know what you need in order to pick the right one. And then um, some of the strategies to do that is to, of course, if you got diagnosed with a condition, then uh, seek out others who have had the condition or family members that have had it to see what they've needed as time went on. Support groups are really good for that. Um, the internet is good because you want to, if you're planning ahead and you want to move to an assisted living, you want to make sure that they have that service of, you know, they, they have services that address those needs. And when you, when you meet an assisted living at the beginning, they are now supposed to give you a list of the services that they can provide. So if they can't provide something that you think you're going to likely need, probably best to look elsewhere. Um, and the other ways to find out what you need is to get a caregiver consultation. There are nonprofits that do private caregiver consultation. And then the county does consultation through their long-term care consultation program. They use an app called Minnesota Choices to do that. Um, sometimes it's nice not to do that until you actually need to get on to medical assistance because there's a time period that the after a certain while that consultation becomes stale and you have to redo it. So if you're going to apply for medical assistance, you want to use the long-term care consultation at some point. Before that, a private caregiver consultation is a good, good option. And if you call the senior linkage line, they can get you in touch with those nonprofits that have those services in your area. Next slide, please, Brenda. Here's a big tip. Number three, do not gift anything if you need medical assistance. Most people who are in assisted living or a nursing home for that matter, at some point are going to run out of money to pay because like I said, assisted living about $2,500 a month roughly or more depending on the need. So you're gonna run through your assets and your income can't keep up. So at some point you're gonna need to apply. And when you apply for medical assistance, the application asks if you've given anything away in the last 60 months plus the month of application. So five years and one month and you've put down that you did, then they're going to add all those up, the value of those things, and they're going to divide it by the average cost of, month of a nursing home care to come up with the number of months that you're ineligible for medical assistance. So if you're ineligible, that means medical assistance isn't gonna pay for your services at assisted living or if you're in the nursing home or at home for that matter, out in the community. Um, so at that point, you can appeal it and maybe you'd fall into an exception, but there are very limited exceptions to gifting. So it's very difficult to get that um, denial reversed. So at that point, the best option might be to do a hardship waiver, but those are hard to get as well. So if you know this beforehand, you can avoid it 
Um, so if you get a diagnosis or your spouse has gotten a diagnosis, then it's likely that you might need help paying for things. Um, don't give anything away. So that's why if you're going to do advanced planning, do it earlier rather than later. And that's something that we can people can come to us to talk about as well. And we will have a session next month on that as well, another webinar session with Kristen. So that's right. I don't want to talk you off about medical assistance, but I had to put that in there because that's a big tip. You don't want to sabotage your medical assistance eligibility. Um, next slide, please, Brenda. So I've um, got a lot of tips all in a row right here. Um, tip number four, uh, here are the things that you should ask in an assisted living facility before you decide to apply there. Uh, first thing, do they accept medical assistance, also known as elderly labor? Because they don't have to. And you don't want to go there unless, unless you can privately pay for your care there for a long period of time. I would suggest looking for another place because most people do need medical assistance. And then ask them how many of their units are designated medical assistance and what do they look like? Because um, as you may imagine, medical assistance, they get paid a set rate from the county. So they're not as profitable. So they're not gonna have as many. So if you start off privately paying for a unit at an assisted living, um, they might not have one uh, available if they don't have a lot of them perhaps you want to ask them, is one available fairly often? And what are they like if you know, on the inside, would you be comfortable living in them? Because I've got another slide later, but if they can, once you're on medical assistance, they can ask you to transfer within the facility to that smaller unit. I want to take a look at them. Um, also, some assisted living facilities will require you to wait a while before you use medical assistance. So you have to privately pay for two years maybe before getting onto medical assistance. So it's good to shop around, even if you don't plan on using an assisted living right away. You get an idea of what, what kind of policies they have. And then finally, like I said before, ask them what services do they offer? And they have a list. Take a look at that list. Um, next slide, please. Unless there's questions, feel free to ask as we go. Here's tip number five. And this is the last tip for a while. Um, don't undermine your advanced planning. Some people have a, a good idea about about what's going to happen in the future and they, they do something, but then they forget how it might impact their planning. So for example, the two year caregiver child exception to the gifting rules for medical assistance can be um, ruined if you go directly from your home into an assisted living. Um, because the rule for the caregiver exception is that you have to transfer into an institution, which is defined under the statute and assisted living aren't an institution. You have to be careful about that. Um, some, of, some of the advice that we do at least. I'm sorry, um, I, I apologize, but I didn't quite understand that. I, it's kind of like it went right over my head. Could you re-say re it? By all means, Lynn, thank you. Uh, medical assistance makes everybody's head spin, and I apologize for, for not remembering that. It took me about two years before it, it all fell into place for me. Um, so, so people like to save their houses for their children, and one of the ways that they do that is they can transfer their home into their child's name if that child has taken care of them for two years prior going into the nursing home. But they, for those two years, they have to have given nursing home level of care. Um, 
if if they go from their home into a nursing home at the time and then do the transfer as the rule allows, that's fine. There's no gift problem. So um, if somebody goes from their house and into an assisted living instead, because it's not an institution, that rule is can't be used because it assisted living don't are institutions. So he can't then do a transfer. So if he did the transfer, the county's gonna say this you gave an uncompensated uncompensated gift and it will make you ineligible for medical assistance for a period of time. But you don't want it to have happen. So it's good to review your plan with somebody who knows medical assistance. We're able to do that for folks if you contact us. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Lynn. Um, next slide, please, Brenda. So how, what are you paying for when you're at assisted living? You're paying for housing and services. Basically rent and payment for the services that you get. A lot of people think that um, medical assistance is gonna pay for your rent, but it doesn't. Um, so that's a big trap that people can fall into as well. Um, so when you have an assisted living, your bill will, will delineate those different things in your monthly bill. And, and it makes a difference too um, for protecting yourself later. If you can't pay for rent, um, and you can pay for services. There are different ways, different protections for non-payment cases. If the assisted living is trying to get you out for non-payment, so it's it's good to know where your money is going and what programs paying for what. And we'll see you probably in the next slide. Yeah, next slide, please, Brenda. Next. Um, well, there's four main ways to pay for rent and services. The first one, of course, is privately paying. You use your own money to pay for the, the rent and services. The second is long-term care insurance. To be quite frank, not very many people have long-term care insurance. Um, in my 20 years at Legal Aid for Elder Law, I've only had a handful of people who have had it. But if they do have it, it can be a very nice way to pay for uh, assisted living. How that works is that you have to meet that insurance policy's definition for um, being qualified for needing assisted living. So they're basically, they, you have to have at least two assisted living, two activities of daily living needs, for example, in order to trigger the policy. Something like that. But once they pay, then they will pay for a fairly long time. And if it's a Minnesota medical assistance policy, then um, you can shelter assets. But not very many people have it because they're expensive, expensive policies. Our main way to pay is medical assistance for services. Like I said, that's elderly waiver. In the alphabet soup that you see from programs, it's MA-DW. And then Kimberly had a question. What if you are a married couple? One has a long-term care and the other does not. How does that work? Um, we will, I'll cover that in a little while if you don't mind, Kimberly. That's a good question. Um, housing supports is the county program that covers that covers uh, rent and housing costs. It used to be known as Group Residential Housing or GRH. Um, I won't go into a whole lot about it um, because we're having another seminar about it later, but those are some links that can get you started. Um, I'll talk about how it works for, for um, married couples in a, I'm just seeing on my slide where the best place to kind of go. Yeah, 
a slide later on that will cover that. So let's move on to the next one. This just points out again that medical assistance elderly waiver only pays for services for housing supports, pays for rent. But this is the big figure. Uh, it only pays for it if the your rent and food are below $934 per month, which is low. So if you're in a unit that costs more than that, housing supports is not going to pay. That's where you can see where assisted living facilities aren't going to want to have all of their units be $934 per month because that's all they're going to get paid for rent that they can get from a resident. So that's why there's only a few medical assistant units at a facility, if there's any. Next slide, please, Brenda. So here's where we can talk about married couples. So this tip is about, about uh, living in the original house while the other spouse is in the assisted living. So I'll talk about this and then talk about uh, payment because it all come, it's all together. Um, so the tip here is that you have to take a look at your budget for maintaining your home. So if, say for example, my husband is gonna go into assisted living, but I'm gonna live here in the home, I wanna know how much I need to sustain my monthly household bills. I need to know how much it's gonna to cost to cover my husband's bills at the assisted living. Because this, the elderly waiver program is trickier for income for couples compared to nursing homes. So it, it considers both couples income together. And then that puts you into three different categories of elderly waiver. And the different categories have different requirements for spending down well, income, called a waiver obligation. So if you're, in, you might fall into that situation where you basically have to pay like a deductible each month towards assisted living costs. And that can come out of both in, both of the household income in order to make it work. But then if you don't have enough money, you just don't have enough money to pay everything. So you got to look at the budget. So in the case, okay, if, uh, if I wanted to stay in my home and I just didn't have the household income with his income and my income to cover it, my other option would be to put my husband in the nursing home at that point, because there I get to keep all my own income. I don't have to worry about covering his asset the nursing home because that's covered by medical assistance if we're asset eligible. And he, sometimes I will even get some of his income to bring mine up further. It's just a, a weird thing with elderly waiver in a very in a certain category in certain circumstances. So it doesn't apply to everybody, but I wanted everybody to know that it could happen. And it's another reason to do some advanced planning with somebody like me who does elder law. I know that that was probably pretty complicated. Um, but it is complicated. So don't feel bad if it, if you if you're confused. Um, I'll have more in-depth information about that at the future seminar. Any questions about this this slide? Did that answer your question, Kimberly? I went to a fashion of some sort. Kind of, yeah, I know it's a lot. Um, but like I said, if people, it's a confusing maze is paying for long-term care. And I don't know how people do it when they're on their own. Uh, it's a, especially when you're in a crisis mode and somebody gets a diagnosis and you need to go somewhere, you need to get services somehow. And how do you pay for it? You're worried about everything. So I just want to 
put a plug in for our organization again. We don't charge anything. And we've got elder law experts here that can help you figure this stuff out, or at least know what to expect. So, and we like to do that and we don't charge. So please call. It's so much better than, than worrying about it. Okay. Um, slide, please. Um, so I already talked about this a little bit, so I won't go into it too much detail. Just the things they can make you move into a smaller apartment once you're on medical assistance. That's why I want you to take a look at what those look like so you're not, not surprised later. If you don't like it, look for a sister living that has a better one. All righty, next slide. Here we get to the fun stuff. This is my bailiwick. This is the keys to the kingdom. This stuff can save you or your family a lot of trouble. You can protect yourself from getting evicted, um, terminated from services, terminated from housing. Um, this is the knowledge is power. Um, and it's definitely a lot more powerful now that the Elder Law, Elder Care and Vulnerable Adult Protection Act is in the books. And there again is the statutes and the rules for that new law. And it, all of the provisions in it are now fully effective. The electronic cameras came effective earlier, but now everything is effective. So the whole thing is up and running. So look at here, this is some of the rights that we get with this new law. This is phenomenal. Um, the right to access counsel or advocacy services. This is great. So this means that if you get any adverse action from an assisted living, a termination notice, for example, they have to let you know that you can have um, a representative, you can have legal counsel, you can have the ombudsman there to help you. Um, you do not have to be alone. They can't do this under the cover of darkness. You get to have somebody in your corner. Um, it's not, it, it, you don't get a paid attorney, unfortunately, but uh, if you come to us, you don't have to check, pay anything anyway. So in effect, you do. You get a free attorney. Uh, next one. This is this is uh, like those dumping cases. You have a right to return home to your assisted living apartment from the hospital or the ER or other something like that. There's no more dumping. Um, we've seen that with nursing homes in the past. You've definitely seen them with assisted living in the past. Federal law took care of that. For nursing homes, this one takes care of it for assisted living. But the important thing is that people need to know it, that they have this right and not give up. The problem that I've seen in the past for nursing homes is that people just don't know they have the one back in. So this is a good one to remember. So if you go to the ER, they can't change the locks, they can't refuse to let you back in. That happens, you call 911 and then you call us, the ombudsman. The ombudsman for long-term care is actually a great resource because they are the advocates for residents of assisted living and nursing homes and group homes and things like that. So their job is to, to be your go-between, to be your voice, to make sure that these things are upheld. So we work in tandem with the ombudsman quite often. Um, right to electronic monitoring in your apartment. So this is um, like where you hide a camera in a in like a stuffed animal or something like that. You can put a camera in your apartment. This is super important as I'll see in later slides. If you've got a family member or you yourself are experiencing some maltreatment or some retaliation, 
It's good to document those things. So you have a right to do that. Um, you have a right to be protected from retaliation. You have a right to have limited reasons for transfers within the assisted living facility. Um, a big one, you have a right to due process. Due process is power. It slows things down and gets you what you want. It gets your solutions that you want. If you didn't have due process, people would be out on the street. The problem is you need to know that you have it. Now you know after today. Now we'll be showing you how to fight the termination. Um, this law has a right to cure contract violations. So this is huge. So if you, when you go into an assisted living, you sign a contract that this is what I'm going to pay. This is you're going to let me live there, and you're going to. I need these services. This is what you're going to provide for services. If you violate some clause in there, you have a right to cure it. So if you don't pay a bill, you have a right to pay it and cure the violation. If you've got certain conduct that's not illegal, um, you can cure that conduct. So uh, very important right. Uh, you have a right to appeal. So if they try to terminate your housing, terminate your services, or non-renew your contract, you have a right to appeal those. Um, finally, you have a right to coordinate and move. What this means is that if all else fails and you're moving, you have to move out, it has to be a soft landing somewhere else. They have to coordinate with you or your representative to find you an appropriate setting with an appropriate provider. So no more just saying, here, adult child, take your parent. You have to be coordinated. It's similar to what you have in nursing homes where you have to be, uh, or it's called orientation, oriented to them. So it has to be appropriate. So that's a huge right as well. Um, next slide, please, Brenda. So there's also the assisted living bill of rights, which of course has all those, uh, I would say, larger feeling rights. So you have a right to uh, association, you have a right to visitors, social participation. You have a right to your own autonomy, to say what you want, when you want it. You have a right to live your life in your assisted living unit. You are not a prisoner. You are not a patient. You are a person who just happens to have contracted for some extra services. You're not to be treated like a child. You are an adult. Um, you have a right to appropriate care and services. If you don't want some kind of services, you can do, you can say, I don't want them. Um, as long as your the conduct without those services doesn't result in a violation of the contract. So in other words, these things are in place to protect yourself from basically a, a facility trying to take over your life. You, you have rights, and these can't be taken away from you. On the next slide. So a little bit more about electronic monitoring. Um, so you have a right to it, but you have to do a few things in order to have it in your unit. If you have a roommate, you have to get their consent, or if they can't individually give consent, you have to get it from the representative. And, it, and the resident has to consent. So if you are a spouse or a family member, um, not the resident, you have to have the resident's consent because it is an invasion of privacy. Um, you have to notify the assisted living facility unless there's been some uh, retaliation allegations or there's been a, a vulnerable adult report. That's what that M-A-R-R-C is, or a police report, or the facility hasn't responded to your written complaint about something. So if those things are in place, or one of them is in place, you can not tell the facility for two weeks. This is so you can maybe catch, catch the bad conduct on tape, so you can use it for a later 
meeting or hearing. Um, as the slide says, you can use the video tape as evidence in any type of um, civil, criminal, administrative with the regular evidence rules. All that means is for evidence rules is you got to establish foundation. You know, what is it? Where did it come from? That's, and then your witness says that, and then you ask for it to be admis, admitted, and then it is. So it's not a problem. But it can be critical evidence if there's something bad going on. So this is a good right to have in your, in your toolbox should you need it. Um, next slide. So getting into retaliation a little bit more, um, you have a right to be protected from retaliation. This is a big deal, uh, legal-wise. Um, this is a base for appealing any adverse action that may happen. And in housing law, if, if the landlord evicts you and says, for whatever reason, but then you say the eviction is in retaliation for me seeking uh, help with my rights in some fashion or submitting a complaint about some repairs or whatever it may be, or seeking help from any government agency or anybody, um, then that's retaliatory. And the fact finder judge can take that into consideration. And in eviction housing cases, that puts the burden onto the management to prove that it's not retaliatory. So it's similar in assisted living facilities. So that's why it's important to document things else, as you'll see from the, my next tip. But retaliation can take many forms. So you want to be aware of it so you can document it. So of course, it's the obvious ones like termination of housing, termination of services, any type of discrimination, um, any type of restricting of the rights that we talked about. Like if you want to visit with somebody and they're saying, nope, we don't want them to come on to the facility, that's that's uh, restricting your right to free association to visit people that you want to visit with. And I would argue that that's retaliation. Um, and that's something you should call us about. Um, if they seclude you somewhere against your will, or they withhold things that you're entitled to, um, including in amenities, uh, this is all retaliation. So keep that in mind, if something doesn't feel right, examine it to see if it's a retaliation for something that you've, you've asked for or you've done. So look for help. So next slide, please, Brenda. So this is a, the next tip. It seems pretty obvious, but this can break, make or break a case. So the tip is to document everything. So. In order to prove violations, like proving retaliation, uh, you want to document things. Document your conversations and incidents in a central place that you always put those sorts of things. Like I would recommend getting a dedicated notebook or a journal and writing them down there. If you have, if you don't like that and you do things electronically, you could have like a Word document and just have everything there. Um, so you have a central place to get it because then you can go back to your notebook and you have everything listed there and you can transfer that information into a complaint to different organizations, agencies. You can transfer it into your appeal. Um, so it's, this is super important. Um, when you're, what you put in, in your notebook is the facts. Don't, don't get into a lot of um, dramatic things. You just want to say date, who said what, what happened. And keep it at that. Stick to the facts. I can't, can't emphasize how important documentation is. All righty, next slide, Brenda. Here we get to termination. This is, this is the 
scary part. So when when you're a resident and you get a termination notice, that effectively is a notice to vacate if it's a termination of a housing. And that's basically an eviction um, because these don't go to district court for evictions. This, is, this can lead to the equivalent of, of eviction. So that's scary. It, termination can also mean termination of services, which is also scary. But the, that's not as scary because you can, you're allowed to bring in services from the outside into the facility. They can't stop you from doing that. And they also have to try different things with their own services as well. And we'll get to that. But here's here's the slide that talks about the due process, right? And I know it might seem dry, but this stuff is important. If they don't give you the right stuff, that's your way to win. So you can stop it, stop the proceedings, stop this termination in its tracks, and they have to go back to square one. Any time that you can slow things down is an opportunity to negotiate for what you want to fix things. So here's what they have to provide. They have to give you a pre-termination notice, and they have to have a pre-termination meeting before they even give you the termination notice. So this is, the, the law is trying to slow things down. So, and the pre-termination notice has to contain certain things. So if the notice isn't valid, that's another reason for somebody like me or you can fight about and get them to, to slow down and, and uh, work something out. So it has to have the ombudsman, long-term care contact information, and your appeal rights. And that uh, termination notice has to be given to you five days before the pre-termination meeting to give you a chance to contact people that can come and be in the corner. Um, if they give it to you two days before, not good enough. And someone like me would say, you got to do it all. It slows things down. It gets get you to a better spot. Same thing with the pre-termination meeting. Um, they have to have a delay between the pre-termination meeting and before they give a termination notice. So, so certain, and they have to give a summary of what you talked about at that pre-termination meeting within 24 hours of that meeting. So what that whole point is, is to give people a chance to figure out is there a way that we can make it work? Is there any reasonable accommodations that can happen to help the resident be successful there? And it has to be, it has to be a good faith effort by the assisted living. It just can't be, yeah, we'll meet with you, but we're not, we're, you know, they're not really into meaningful solutions. They have to be meaningful. They have to be engaged. Um, if something is worked out, they have to put it down in that summary. And that summary is a contract. So if you've worked out something where, um, for example, an easy one would be non-payment of rent. Let's say you worked out a payment plan where you're going to pay $700 for the next four months to get caught up. That's a reasonable reason, let's say, because maybe something happened where you couldn't, couldn't keep track of your money. Or another accommodation would be if somebody had a behavior issue that the management said was just too much for them to handle. If, you, if there is a solution that would help, help you with the behaviors and it won't cause an undue burden on the facility, it's a reasonable accommodation. They have to try it and see if it works out. That can be put into that summary and that's a contract. And then later, if it goes to termination and they didn't try it, that's a basis for the judge to throw it out, throw out the termination. So I know it's pretty detailed, but all these little things can be give you leverage. Um, next slide, please, Brenda. So there are only three reasons that assisted living facility can 
terminate your housing or your services. And that's non-payment, violation of a lawful part of an assisted living contract. Lawful meaning that it's um, not uh, something that's, it can't be unenforceable. So you could have um, assisted living that says you waive your right to um, have a camera in your room, for example. That would not be a lawful per provision, so it's unenforceable. So if they say later you're getting terminated because you have a camera in your room, that's not a violation of a lawful part of a contract. It's not a valid basis to terminate. terminate. So that would be a, a good appeal. The third way, third reason to terminate is for certain conduct. And that's conduct that's either going to be hazardous to either residents or staff or it's illegal conduct, like um, illegal drug use or things of that nature. And it's expedited. So that uh, it has less due process because of the danger factor. So those are the only three reasons that a uh, learning can terminate. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I should say that this is more rights than you would have in a standard apartment because in a standard apartment, if you get a good notice that has enough time in the notice before the move out date, you can be evicted. You don't need a reason in our standard um, apartment. And it's typically the 30 days. Um, but here, they can't do that. They can't just give you a notice saying, we want you to move out by um, X date and not give you a reason. They have to have a reason and it has to be one of those three, non-payment, um, a violation of a clause in the contract or uh, expedited violation. Um, so non-payment, they have to give you a right to cure and they have to tell you that there's places that will pay, help pay for things. So they have to give you the senior linkage line number um, so you can find out how to find those programs by the pay for them. So that's the county elderly waiver application. Um, next slide, please, Brenda. Um, so the second reason is violation of some clause in the contract. So like I said before, you have to have a right or opportunity to cure it within a reasonable time after you get written notice of it. So it's not sufficient for them to just say, hey, we want you out. They have to put it in writing and give it to you and then give you a chance, a reasonable chance to cure it. And reasonable is squishy. It just depends on what the circumstances is. And you want it to be squishy so you can negotiate. Alrighty, next slide, please, Brenda. Here's the expedited termination. So the reason why this is so dense is that you, for expedited terminations, you can either, the facility can terminate both your housing or services at the same time, or they can choose just to terminate your services contract, you know, the service part of the contract. Um, but remember, this is only for health and safety reasons, illegal conduct. Uh, so we're talking about any, in the, Wording is super important. So, for example, let's say they they say we can't handle your handle you. You're out. Both housing and your services are terminated, or or something. They if it's contact conduct that you're doing, um, it has to substantially interfere with the rights or health or safety of other residents. So, if they are alleging that you're interfering with somebody's rights. It can't be the rights of the staff. It has to be residents. If it's conduct, you can see the next one, they can get you out for conduct that substantially and intentionally interferes with the physical health of staff. So there's a lot of words there that you can get it appealed. So it has to be substantial conduct and intentional conduct that only interferes with physical health. So you can see that staff 
is a lot more limited in what they can use to get you out. And then um, the conduct, they can do the third one is if you, if it's not health and safety, then it's gotta be something prohibited under standard landlord tenant law. And that's uh, illegal weapons, illegal drugs, prostitution, those sorts of things. So that, those are the three things that they can use to get your housing and services terminated. If they just say, hey, we can't give you services anymore, um, these are the two reasons, these are three reasons why they can say that. They can either say that your conduct is substantially interfering with other residents' health or safety, so we, we just can't handle it anymore. Or they can say your needs exceed our scope of our services that we agreed upon. And um, your needs, you didn't disclose that need when you first came in. Um, that's one way to get you out. But if you can show that they do provide that service or you can get it from another provider, then they can't get you out for that. Third reason to stop your services is some kind of extraordinary thing happened that caused them to not be able to do any services. Like um, perhaps um, all, the, all the staff quit or the building was hit by a tornado or something like that. So that, that's expedited termination. Um, Please. So like I said, tip number nine, words matter. This law is full of good words for residents. So like I said before, all these things are important and it gives you wiggle room to stop the termination or to win an appeal because they have to prove things. Sometimes you have to prove things. But if the facts don't fit what the judge is going to say substantial, it means to them or what intentionally means, then they're not going to be able to win and terminate your housing. All these things are super good. Before this law, we had none of it. So we're in a lot stronger position for residents' rights. Next slide, please, Brenda. Uh, tip number 10, this is my last tip, I believe. Always ask for a reasonable accommodation. Um, like I said, in that pre-termination meeting, that's where you ask for reasonable accommodations, but you can ask for them at any time. You don't have to wait for problems to happen. But where this comes from is that housing law, it's fundamental that if you have a disability that is causing you problems to be successful in your home, and it's by, you're violating the lease or the rules, the law says that you have a right to be accommodated to find a solution so you can stay there. And you're going to be allowed to bend that rule uh, to stay there. So it effectively says that, sure, you violated this rule or lease clause, but this thing that you're gonna do is gonna stop it or likely stop it from happening in the future. So if you can show that you have a disability, tied to a problem and you have an idea to prevent it, that's a reasonable accommodation. And the only way uh, a landlord, which the assisted living is, can stop it is if they can show that it would be an undue burden or it would fundamentally alter how they do business at the assisted living. And I can guarantee you that not much will, will be an undue burden or fundamentally alter. So always, always ask for a reasonable accommodation. This is a powerful tool. I can't stress it enough. It will save your housing. Next slide, please, Brenda. And finally, appeal rights. So if all else fails and you went, you got the pre-termination notice, you had the pre-termination meeting, um, and nothing was working, Let's say you had a reasonable accommodation and the assisted living says, yeah, we tried it, not working. We're going to terminate. And they give you a termination notice. You have a right to appeal it. So this appeal goes to the fact finder, which is the administrative law judge. It's an administrative hearing. 
it's the equivalent to going to eviction court where you have the, the district court judge, um, but it's an administrative hearing. It's less formal, It's uh, but you have due process rights. Um, there's burden of proof required. Um, you can appeal a termination if you dispute any of the facts that the assisted living is alleging. And if you would have great harm from a termination, let's say you don't have a place to go, um, or your health would be in danger for if they terminate your services, for example, or if the termination violates the law, let's say they didn't do what they needed to do. They didn't do the pre-termination meeting or they, the timing was off. Any of those little things that we can hang our hat on is an appealable uh, point in the hearing, which the judge can rule in your favor on. If you cured a violation or if you have the ability to cure it, that's a, a reason to appeal. And if you identified in a reasonable accommodation and they didn't try it or didn't give enough effort to try, that's appealable. Or if later you've identified a reasonable accommodation, you appeal it then too. So that's what the new law has created for folks. It's created a huge blanket of protection that wasn't there before in assisted living. And it's brand new. I'll be happy to see how it plays out. I know there'll be some bugs in the beginning to work out, but we have used it to that legal aid at least a little bit when the, in the summertime when assisted livings were transitioning over, they were giving, right before August, they were giving bad notices to vacate. So we were able to slow those down and then get them into August where all this new stuff applies. So it's been very useful to use this new stuff. Next slide, please, Brenda. Well, coordinated move I talked about before, so I won't go into detail. Basically, if a move has to happen, it has to be a soft landing, appropriate location, appropriate per service provider. Next, next slide. Here's some people and organizations that can be very helpful. Their contact information, there's the senior linkage line, Ombudsman for long-term care, Minnesota Elder Justice Center. They have a consumer manual about preventing terminations from assisted living. Um, and they are, they are statewide, so they are a good resources, resource to call as well. Your county public health and human services department can often be useful, especially if you want to find out about the programs that pay for rent and for services. Caregiver consultants, they're excellent to help you figure out what services you might need and what can pay for them when you're not quite ready to go to the county yet. Senior Linkage Line or MIN can help you find the local uh, nonprofits that provide that service. Um, so those are good places to go. And you can see I put a compass there as to guide you through the main. And of course, you can contact uh, us. Um, next slide, please, Brenda. Here is my contact information. Um, that's my direct number. Uh, if you contact me, I'd have to send you to our main number, which I realized I forgot to put on here. I'm going to put it in the chat. But our main number, or you can go on the website and do an online intake um, to see if we can make a file. And then they'll get to me most likely because it's a senior elder law topic. Um, and like I said, it's it's not you're not out anything by contacting us. We don't charge anything, and we're a good good place to start if it's something that we won't fully represent on. Uh, for other matters, for ex for example, we can at least get started. But certainly for planning, advanced planning for long term care, these type of issues, or adverse actions from assisted living, any questions, please contact us. I'm trying to remember my, my number. 
right. Well, thank you very much, Kristen, for all of that information. That's you're right. It is overwhelming, but it's also nice to know that you've got that you guys are there to be that guide and to help folks navigate that and give this gives folks some a, a good foundation to start from at least as they're looking um, at assisted living. Let's see. We've got a couple of. Okay, that was just the, I see that Kristen put the intake number in the chat. Um, and is does anyone else have any other questions before we wrap up today? If you if you do, feel free to unmute yourself and just jump in. Okay, I, I have a question just in terms of an example, uh, because I'm a little hazy on the difference between uh, causing uh, a, a hazard with a resident as opposed to a staff. Um, and the example I'd like to use is, let's say that you have a uh, resident that has some delusions, paranoia due to uh, Parkinson's. And they think that literally there's a... Um, quote, not food fight, but a, he is throwing ice at the other residents because he thinks everybody's doing this. He thinks they're having a, an ice fight. Okay. <laughs> That's, you know, yeah. okay. So the danger in that case would appear to me not to be to the staff. It would appear to be to the residents. Is, is that, cons is that a right for termination? Or when you're talking about the pre-things, um, is there a way that staff can control that sort of thing without their, their health being involved? In other words, is that actually uh, something that can be cured? There, that's the question I've got. In some way, um, as opposed to that's, you know, that's causing a safety hazard, they, they gotta go. Great. So Lynn, that's an excellent situation and question because it comes up a lot. Um, and it would be conduct that they would be able to do an ex 